The basic stories are uh, people are escaping uh, all kinds of uh, persecution in their homeland. Yes. Because of who they are and because of climate change. People want to have a better world for themselves and for their children. And that's, those are so primary desire of all human beings. Yes. It's just that in the world today, even our national borders, we are closing those doors. And therefore, refugees and asylum seekers have become an issue. But asylum seekers and refugees are not asking for a handout. They are simply people migrating to a better place uh, to make life better for their children and their family. They want to be free. I mean, this is our human spirit. We all want to be free in whatever way you do it. I'm not putting a political, political term to it. They want to be free to, to be happy, to be able to support themselves, explore the world, have a, a chance for their imagination to, 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 to bloom. Yes. So I, I think this is a basic human spirit, yeah. using anthropology to go into doing work that assists the asylum seekers who are seeking refuge. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still on site at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia. This is our second partnership with them. We are now going to be speaking with Dr. Chor Swan Nin. Hi, Swan. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for coming on our program. Thank you for having me. And congratulations on your new book, Identities on Trial in the United States. You've been professing for a long time, 26 years, at uh, Cal State Los Angeles. You also founded the Asian and Asian American Studies AAAS program at CSULA. And this new book is really profound about the radical shifts, um, the, uh, radically shifting the asylum-seeking narrative. And I'm really excited to dive into it. I want to ask you one of our favorite questions that we ask on the show. Do you think that we're really all one? Yes, of course. The refugees and asylum seekers are no different from us. We are all one. We are all part of the human condition. And what is the most upstream issue that we face? Is it our feelings of separation from each other and from nature, this feeling, this lack of interconnectedness? I, I think we are very connected. Refugees and asylum seekers are knocking on our doors. And what do we do? All that we need to do is just open the door. We are one. We are really one. And in a way, we could ask the question, why are we knocking on our doors? The doors are mostly the Western democracies. And that's because there are problems in the world. I think if we don't see them as uh, in a negative way, if we see them as people who are questioning the system that's not right in the world, then we are all one. All of us inside, behind this door, are also searching for a better world and finding better answers for all of us in the world. Yes, yes. Architecting the next world that maximizes flourishing for all of us. And what is it about um, this from a very like macro level perspective, from a very historical context? It doesn't even seem like there were ever any borders, that there were ever any tribes, that this has always been just a human tribe. And then over time, it became borders with resources, with governments, with hierarchies, with tribes, with now there's an asylum seeker that, and, and they even have to knock. And um, that even with, uh, the more enlightened we are, the less we even have war and conflict that causes asylum seeking. Has that been a pretty common theme? Is that, is it war and conflict that causes people to asylum seek in the first place? There are two parts to it. If you look at the world historically, people have always searched for refuge. In the Arabian Peninsula in the past, 
people knock on <coughs> doors. And, and in the past, people provided hospitality in their tents for people who escaped difficulties in their tribe and in their homeland. Today, we have the same mechanism, but it's more text, that's all. So the question is, do we have the same hospitality for those who are seeking help? If you think about the major religions in the world, we have always given help to other people. So giving hospitality and help is a human value, it's a human condition that we have always done. Yeah. And the fact that we are closing more doors, of course, the governments can say, uh, we are overwhelmed by all these refugees coming to our country. They can always say they are in various negative terms. Mm -hmm. That is the current condition. Okay? Yeah. We can go into why those things happen. But in terms of the larger picture, we have always been asking for help. And hospitality. And, and given hospitality yeah. at the same time. So this is no different. Yeah. I love those two words, help and hospitality. So over time, there's always been, since the dawn of time, there's always been times of people coming and asking for help and other people providing hospitality. Yes. And that's been a major aspect of our cooperation. That's right. And our social bonding and our ability to do that process of maximizing flourishing, just making it so that people feel loved and that being a really rooted principle. I, I like that a lot, help and hospitality. Now, what is, you know, it does seem like there's a mainstream media fear-based narrative that is propagated. Um, and also, you can kind of see in some levels of, of ch childhood consciousness that uh, children that are born um, with other children around them of different religions or uh, skin colors and all these different types of things end up being more open. They have a deeper level of openness. Um, and then kind of like the more archaic, older consciousness ha maybe still has a little bit more fear, xenophobia, things like this. Do you kind of see a younger consciousness that's more open as well? I, I think uh, we can go into the theories and anthropology as to why people close their doors, why people uh, put up categories of who can get in and who cannot get in. But that's, I hope we don't go into that topic today because there are some basic stories we need to tell first. Yes, all right? what are these stories? The yes. basic stories are uh, people are escaping uh, all kinds of uh, persecution in their homeland. Yes. Because of who they are and because of climate change. People want to have a better world for themselves and for their children. And that's, those are so primary desire of all human beings. Yes. It's just that in the world today, given our national borders, we are closing those doors. And therefore, refugees and asylum seekers have become an issue. But asylum seekers and refugees are not asking for a handout. They are simply people migrating to a better place uh, to make life better for their children and their family. That's very profound, even just that you kind of give us this idea of someone just being born into the world and wanting uh, to, when they look around them, they see uh, a lot of maybe conflict or complexity, things that cause them to um, want to seek a better life uh, for themselves and their children. And then this is where maybe refuge and asylum seeking happens uh, and not seeking a handout, but seeking a better life for themselves and their children. I like that way framing they, it. They want to be free. I mean, this is our human spirit. We all want to be free in whatever way you do it. I'm not putting a politi political term to it. They want to be free to, to be happy to be able to support themselves, explore the world, have uh, a, a chance for their imagination to, 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 to bloom. Yes. So I, I think this is a basic human spirit. Yes. Wherever you go, that's why we migrate out of Africa. We have gone, human beings have gone all, to all over the world. Exploration. Exploration, Creativity, adventure. Creativity, adventure, yeah. yeah. Creativity, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So it's not because they are here knocking on our door and say, no, give me your welfare system. No, they just, they think about themselves first. They don't think about what you have. They think about 
who they are and what they want to do because of their love for their family and for themselves because they're adventurous. That's our human, basic human spirit. Swana, I have a question. Where were you born? I was born in China. Where in China? In southeastern part of China. Southeastern. The reason is because my grandfather had gone to Southeast Asia before the 1900s. Yeah. Then he sent for my father to join him. And then when my father was of age, he sent my father back to China to marry my mother. It was a matchmake marriage. Yes. So I was born there, and then when I was two, they took me to Singapore to join them. Yes. And then uh, they sent me to Malaysia. My father and my mother went with me to, at that time, British Malaya. Yeah. And that's where I grew up. Wow. And so this also, um, in many ways, explains your focus on uh, Southeast Asia and Asian um, refuge and asylum seeking. Okay, so now what's actually going on? There's a lot of conflict. Let's talk about what is the conflict that is causing people to want to do refuge and asylum seeking, and then we can get into the actual stories and trials. There's conflict everywhere in the world. People have conflict because of differences between groups, and oftentimes the, the differences are created artificially by those in power. Mm -hmm. And as a result, people who want to search for a better refuge or to be free, they leave their country. This is speaking about people migrating in general terms. What is the interest of people in power to create artificial differences to try and move people into asylum seeking or refuge? Do they want their land? Do they want their resources? What do, what do they want? Why do people want power? Why do people seek more things beyond what they need to live on, to eat? If you have one pillow to sleep on, why do you need six pillows? If you need one plate of food, why do you need five plates on? If you have one house, you have shelter, why do you need real estate everywhere in the world? I mean, yeah. that I do not know. So I think it's that, that greed for power, the greed for resources that le lead to other people not having some of those things uh, or, uh, or preventing other people from having some of those things. So some people must leave. And then the explanation we give is because, oh, they are from a lower group of people in society. Mm. They are from there, they are not one of us. Mm -hmm. they, are, they don't have the same belief. They don't have the same outlook about life. So this is why people are, are persecuted. That's the word. It seems like the most upstream issue then is people that have yet to enlighten and therefore focus more on greed um, and dehumanizing um, and make creating the artificial differences that then cause asylum or refuge, which then um, make it so that they themselves can do things like further propagate their power, their wealth. Um, so there's a really deep need, we talk about this quite a bit, for these 1,500 billionaires on the planet to have a deeper sense of interconnectedness, unconditional love, um, uh, architecting the next world, but also on a grassroots level, we need to build that next world as well. And I wanna, let's do, let's do some of the examples. Are some of the, I think this one at least has been talked about a little bit, but um, the, uh, Rohingyans is one of them in Myanmar. This is one of the examples of people being displaced. Yes. Yes. The Rohingyas are Muslim. And uh, the country where they came from is Myanmar. And most of them are Buddhist. Of course, the Buddhists could see them as a Muslim and try to expel them. And that's the, that's the official narrative. 
But if you were to look at the grassroots level, Muslims and Hindus have always lived next to each other mm. throughout most of Southeast Asia. Mm. Even today, there are Muslims and Hindus and Christians who live right next door to each other. So how did that happen in Myanmar? That's the question, I think. Yeah. And each country has its own story about exclusion. But then go back to your grass, the, your question about the grass, which level. Yeah. Do we know our neighbors? Do we worry if our neighbors are Christians or Buddhists or Muslims? For the most part, we don't care. Mm. It's not an issue. We can still go about our business, washing our cars, cooking our meals, going to work. We don't worry about their beliefs. And it's just at that point about how can we get along? Can we still coexist regardless of their beliefs? Well, we still go to work, you know, go through our, you know, our routine every day. So it's not in a way their religion. It's not the religion. It's not in a way many things that we talk about that divide us. So how do we then? So I mean, go back to your thing about the the, the millionaires and billionaires. Should they think about? Should we try to enlighten them for them to think about the rest of the world? I don't know. I don't know what to do because I don't know any billionaire. But I think in, uh, at the everyday level, if the person happens to be my neighbor, could I be a friend with that person regardless of the person's wealth? The same way I say, can my neighbor be my friend regardless of the person's belief? So it's that, that level of interaction. So human, I, I don't think about you right now as a person of a different color, faith, or wealth. So we are able to talk to each other and explore these very important and unique questions about human condition. So how do we reach that level of our, so we use the word commonality. Yeah. That commonality is our humanness, yes. our human oneness. The love in the hearts, the, just the, yeah, that unity, how do we reach that? How do we make that something common for not only people at the top of socioeconomic status, top of governments, top of corporations, um, and also on a grassroots level, how do we make it so when children are born into the world that those are the things that we prioritize? We talk about this so much, but rather than prioritizing the, you mentioned this as well, instead of when you have one home, instead of going for five or 10 homes or five or 10, designer watches or clothes or cars or boats or planes, etc. Think about the other gifts that humans can bring into the world that 50% of them are still making less than $2.50 a day. What if they got patroned even $1,000 from you or $10,000 from you? What could they unleash creatively into the world that would make the world a better place? And so I'm very, very fascinated with that exact question and then architecting the the next protocols that enable the flow of that enlightened capital to the artistic endeavoring of these beautiful hearts of so many people. And then also, um, you know, we, we started on, we just gave one example of, uh, of um, Muslims and Buddhists living nearby, nearby each other and um, being able to find peace in pluralism. Um, versus being able versus uh, trying to create some sort of artificial differences that then create refuge in asylum seeking. Well, I really want us to get behind the eyes of specific cases that you write about. And you actually even um, had an, a, a courtroom attorney um, who participated in some of the chapters. So yeah, teach us about, let's get behind the eyes of some of the examples and then the complexity of what the trials are even like. Well, since we are at the American Anthropological Association, I'm going to talk about what we do in anthropology. Yes. So in anthropology, we teach about race. We do research on race, culture, ethnicity, gender, religion issues. And these are the subjects our students learn. But in the case of uh, asylum cases, these are the same criteria that the 1951 UN Convention on Refugees require 
for people to say I was persecuted on account of my race, my religion, my membership in a particular social group. That usually means gender issues, my nationality, and my political opinion. So how can we uh, think about using anthropology to go into doing work that assists the asylum seekers who are seeking refuge? Okay, that's a mm -hmm. Yes, macro yes. question we are talking yes, yes. about. And I should tell you also my first case. My first case came about because this woman from Indonesia, she said she was from Indonesia, and she faced uh, all kinds of turmoil in her homeland, and then she escaped by coming to the US on a tourist visa. Then she applied for asylum, and the immigration officer in Anaheim, Orange County, said that you have not proof that you are of the Chinese race. You said that you were persecuted because you were Chinese in Indonesia. Well, go proof that you are Chinese, a Chin of the Chinese race. But she said, how do I prove myself as a Chinese race? And he said, go and find an anthropologist. So this woman and her paralegal actually contacted a forensic anthropologist wow. who told her that if it came to me dead on arrival, I could do some osteometric measurement on you. Then maybe I could tell you where you came from. But she said, that's not the kind of answer I want. So she contacted me, not because I've done anything like this. You know, I teach anthropology, general anthropology. I teach a course, courses on race and racism, courses on Asia. And then the first question she asked me when she came to my office was, can you tell that I'm Chinese? Well, anthropologists talk about race as a uh, social construct. We cannot tell if a person is of the Chinese race or whatever. So I said, I'm not gonna answer that question. And then she told me her story about what had happened to her and how she fled with 100,000 people in, from Indonesia about, you know, what, about Chinatowns were burnt and Chinese women were gang raped in public. So I was thinking to myself, how can I help her? I've never done this before, and who should I contact? I don't know. But I grew up in Malaysia. I speak the local languages, Bahasa Malaysia, the language of Malaysia and also the language of Indonesia. I also speak several Chinese dialects. So I said, if I don't know, if I don't help her, who will? So I sat down with her and we had a long interview and I figured out who she was. Mm. The other thing was, if I cannot use the word, the idea of race in court, then uh, what about using her culture, right? If we don't use race mm -hmm. as a criteria, mm -hmm. if I'm not able to verify her race, what about using culture as a proxy, as a substitute? But this woman came to me without a Chinese name. She didn't speak Chinese. She didn't know how to write Chinese. How to prove that? Yeah. She's of Chinese background. So I, I worked on that and I wrote a chapter called How Chinese Must a Chinese Be? Mm -hmm. In the book. Mm -hmm. So how much do you have to be of Chinese yeah. value or characteristic in order to be a Chinese? But eventually uh, using uh, uh, a kinship, uh, kinship diagram using how she addresses her relatives, using how her, her, her mother addresses her, calls her. Mm -hmm. I was able to figure that she was indeed of uh, Chinese origin. When you compare her by a process elimination, she couldn't be another person from Indonesia. So I was able to do it despite the fact that the, the lawyer for her and the immigration officer said that we need to prove her race. So I was able to verify that she was of Chinese background without using the idea of race. And the, uh, and the judge granted her asylum. Why, wow. do, why do we even ask for proof of race? The and and can we use uh, DNA, ancestry, can we, we can't, pinpoint where from 
hair or saliva? The ideal race was created during the Enlightenment when the Europeans were out there exploring the world and they came upon people who were quite different from them. So at that time, there was a classification of people based on different so-called races, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negro, and so on. And those are ideas that have been banished a long time ago. But the idea of race was used during, this, uh, during Hitler's regime. He was interested in the purity of, of the race, of the superior race. So the idea of race can be pure and others are less pure came to dominate the thinking of what we call scientific racism by thinking that there are some people who are not of the superior race. We have been racist against them. Okay, that's a term we use in anthropology of scientific racism. So when 1951, uh, UN Convention on Refugees was created, and also a couple of other declarations before that, there was to the counter Hitler's uh, expelling, a killing of you know, more than six million people in Europe. Besides the Jews, the people who were killed were also people from Poland, people who were handicapped, people who were gay, and people who were not pure, not part of the superior race. So, uh, so the 1951 refugee convention was to really to argue that people who were persecuted because of their race should be allowed to uh, have refuge in a different country. So that's, that was how it came about. But since then, biologists and geneticists have been looking at the idea of race. And they say, human beings are all of the same race. There's no gene for race. The difference between, let's say, give you two extremes, a black and a white person, mm -hmm. an African-American and a white person in the US. The difference between those two individuals is at the most maybe less than 1% in terms of differences. We share more in common. We share 99.9% in terms of similarity. What, and what accounts for the differences are just a few things, such as skin coloration, hair texture. There are lots of things that uh, we share that we don't see. So there isn't really a gene for race. There's no gene for race. So biologists and uh, geneticists don't study race anymore. It's a non-starter. It's a, it's a waste of everybody's time. But in the social sciences, in the everyday world, the word race was retained. And it is retained because uh, every nation in the US, for example, in 1790, when the census was first used, the census tried to uh, think about people within the nation. Or uh, can they be responsible for taxation? Can they vote uh, based on that kind of criteria? Then some people were given one label or the other. For instance, in 1790, the Chinese were not considered citizens, and they were not white, and therefore they couldn't be citizens, and they were not white. In fact, the Chinese were classified once upon a time as Negro in the US. So the US census created all these terminologies for people in the US. We can say that race and later on ethnicity are really social constructions of the census of the US government by way of the US Census Bureau. But law was also out there to perpetuate what had created early on. So the US Census Bureau, US laws, and uh, social scientists follow the same pattern of using the word race and using the same classification. Let me give you one example that I found very interesting. Mm -hmm. When uh, Franz Boas, the famous anthropologist who escaped uh, German Nazism, came to the US and became the founder of anthropology at Columbia University, he was asked by the Armenians 
in the U.S. to define their race. And Franz Boyer said that they were white. Well, at the time when the Armenians were classified as white, they were able to own land, and they were eventually able to become citizens. And this is really important. The Japanese who were on the West Coast, they didn't consult with uh, Franz Boas. They were not allowed to become citizens. They were not allowed to buy land, own land. And later on, by the Second World War, they were interned. Mm -hmm. So how a person is defined has tremendous consequences. And yet this idea of race was socially constructed historically to exclude certain people. But today, we talk about all oh, black, white, you know, and so on. And, and that's a legacy from this historical period when race was created. And that we call that social race. And I think we have not done a good job of uh, reflecting on the, on the uselessness of how that term divides us. Because if you were to sit two people together, we have a lot more in common yeah. than what we are different. And what we are different may be a few, yeah. a few, a few, minor characteristics and you and I don't even care whether the person is a shade, a shade browner or darker or lighter, you know, because that, that, that really doesn't affect our, our relationship, our interaction. Their heart and their level of enlightenment is the most important thing. Yes. And you give, you give us this macro level picture of evolution where it comes to a point of oneness, of unity of the species and then from there then the social constructs of dividing us by differences make it so that then um, it does in a sense make tie it to this point that you made earlier where people in positions of power um, or when the greedy can point people at each other for those differences, create artificial conflict, and then create refuge and asylum seeking. And you use this word again, help and hospitality, you use these words again. When someone comes knocking in refuge and asylum, uh, I was very surprised when you said that, um, that there needs to be some sort of uh, documentation of the person's race, um, when really it's just another human and that when the human comes in need of help and hospitality, it's about figuring out how to provide that help and hospitality. And so that's why this example of you going through um, with this Indonesian that was seeking um, refuge in the U.S. in Anaheim, it was very surprising to me you know, learning about our process. Um, there must be better ways to create help and hospitality in these circumstances around the world. And because it is for the human heart and the human enlightenment to do our best to um, provide people with a better life towards flourishing and their children. So this is one example, one of many examples. There are, there's a lot more nuance. Yes, will you give us some more as well? Let me just give you one more example about why uh, anthropologic expertise is important in this kind of work. So there are women out there who have claimed that, in fact, in one of my, couple of my cases, uh, they claimed that they were, they were victims of horrible sexual violence. Okay. When that happens, we don't have witnesses and we don't have physical evidence. By the time they come to the, the, the legal system to apply for asylum, so how do we deal with something like that? So for me as an anthropologist, uh, the law, of course, requires that she must prove persecution because of the fact that she's of uh, a gender, a woman, okay? That's what we have to do. So for me as an anthropologist, I said we study culture. We study a person's uh, a role and position within a society. So I solved the problem of this woman, and that case is mentioned in the book. I solved the problem by thinking about her and how she felt so ashamed in her community. She was so ashamed, she could not even face her husband. And they didn't have a relationship for a long time. She said every time he tried to touch on her shoulder, she would say, I'm tired. 
She was so ashamed, she ran and escaped and lived in her sister's house where nobody could see her or know her. And she told her daughter, go tell people I've moved to a different country. So on, on, her, physical, on her face, from her physical appearance, you cannot tell that something had happened to her. There was a violation of her, her sanctity in terms of how she sees herself. So when I listened to her stories and the trauma that she had gone through, so I wrote about how she felt so shameful. It was a shame that defined her life, that structured her everyday behavior. And I told that story, I wrote that story for the, for the judge and for the government attorney because they read that document and she was granted asylum. I was so happy. So in other words, the judges and the lawyers, these asylum adjudicators, they are human beings too. Mm -hmm. They listen, they can relate to those stories. As much as people say, oh, they are fraudulent, they are economic migrants, they want to be here because they want to uh, get, a, get a piece of the American pie. But how do you account for the fact that they are judges and lawyers who also uh, give them asylum, not because I did a good job of proving that they were persecuted because of this or that, but I think somewhere along the line, they must have opened their heart. Yes. They must have seen that something, something really horrible happened to her. Yes. yes, it happened, but also the fact that she was wounded as a person and that the adjudicators can relate to that human beings can be wounded and they also want something better. This is why I'm optimistic that, uh, that, uh, that the system works as much as I know how difficult it is for asylum seekers to win asylum. I love the focus on healing these traumatic experiences and when in need of help, we provide hospitality towards healing, towards growth and towards evolution and we can build a better future together that way. Will you give us an idea of some of these numbers? How many asylum adjudicators are there in the U.S.? How many people seek asylum or refuge in the U.S. maybe per year? Do we have an idea of these numbers? The numbers are out there, but I've not been keeping track of the numbers. I know that uh, we have been admitting uh, fewer and fewer refugees uh, in the U.S. We used to be the biggest refugee uh, 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 takers in the world, used to be. And how many was that, do we know, approximately? No, we, we took in, after the uh, Vietnam War, yeah. we, took in, we took in over a million refugees from Vietnam. Wow. We took in a lot of Haitians, and then people from Central America, we gave them temporary protective uh, statuses, yeah. TPS, so we've been taking them. Uh, in one fashion or the other. But these past two years, our uh, number for refugees have gone down tremendously. I, I, I cannot even, I don't want to quote the number because it was so low, it was embarrassing. There's a, a colleague of mine uh, who has been working with a refugee and uh, she was uh, looking at support for this young man and she had to reach out to different people. And she reached out to the presiding bishop's fund, all the way to the top, and said, do you have funding for this young man at my university with, who needs help for besides housing, you know, school fees? And they said, yes, we have the funding because we have not been supporting refugees going to the US. So it's that kind of level I want to let you know in terms of that yes, repercussions, and in a way, in this case, this is a good repercussion for this young man, but so we are not taking as many because I don't want to quote the number. The numbers keep changing, the refugee uh, laws keep changing in the US. So uh, I was going to ask you that next. What are the refugee and asylum seeking laws in the United States, and how do they differ between countries as well? Some countries in the world uh, uh, have signed on to the 1951 Refugee Convention. And then they also uh, 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 they also signed on to the 1987. Uh, uh, I'm I'm not sure what's the term. 
the amendment that updates the 1951 mm -hmm. convention because that was for people escaping uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. And then since then, other countries, people can come to uh, protocol, 1987 protocol. Okay. So, yes. so, uh, so some countries do and some countries don't. So let me give you one example. In the case of Malaysia, Malaysia, okay, so the U.S. is a member of the Refugee Convention and we accept refugees. Of these protocols? Yes. And how many countries are a part of these protocols? Do we know? I, I don't know. I you mean, most, know. Of the, okay. most of them are Western European countries. Okay. So Germany, okay. France, Italy, yes, yes. UK, Sweden, Norway. And there's some sort of uh, asylum adjudication process that... Within each nation. Within each nation each that nation. follows the yes. protocols. Yes. Okay. So in okay. the case of Malaysia, Malaysia is not, uh, uh, did not sign on to this protocol. So then you have a uh, large number of uh, Rohingyas and Syrians right now in Malaysia. Yeah. In fact, there are 170,000 asylum seekers who are Rohingyas, Syrians, uh, Afghans in Malaysia. Oh. They are registered with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. So they are living in Malaysia. They are not living in refugee camps. They are scattered throughout the community, find housing whenever they can. But because they are not recognized by the Malaysian government, they cannot work legally. So there are big companies that want to hire them but they are afraid to break Malaysian law because they cannot hire them legally because they are not recognized as refugees in Malaysia. So this is a difficult bind for the mm -hmm. asylum seekers. It's a difficult situation for the UNHCR. They don't have jurisdiction over Malaysian law. Yeah. And the Malaysian politicians, I mean, why do politicians do what they do? I don't know. There are many reasons I don't want to explore. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for Malaysian refu uh, politicians who say, you know what? They are our neighbors, right? They are here already. They are not in refugee camps. They want to contribute. An amendment to enable them to work. Why not? Why not? They are already working. It's just that they are working illegally and therefore they are exploited by the employers. Versus legally, yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Versus okay. legally, they can, they can improve their condition a lot better. The U.S. opened the doors to the Vietnamese 35, 40 years ago. We did that. And look at what happened today to the Vietnamese. They are, they are one of the most successful groups. They are our doctors and optometrists and dentists and teachers and engineers. In our community, the same with the Haitians, right? And the Cubans, especially mm -hmm. in Florida. Mm -hmm. So we have done a great job. And we think about the other people who came from other countries, from Poland, from the UK, from Ireland, from Italy. Mm -hmm. They are part of the makeup of, of the US. Yeah. And what makes America great is all the people who say, the system in my country didn't quite work. I'm coming here to make the system better. Yes. So if you think about the asylum seekers and refugees today knocking on our door mm -hmm. here, they are doing the same thing. They are the critique of the systems that have not worked elsewhere. And they're saying, you want to make, that, make things better. So I do want to see them as abstract numbers or in a negative way, mm -hmm. I see them as people with such clarity about what's going on and we're able to critique what is wrong in the system. Yeah, if, if the hospitality is provided at these times of, of need of help, then it can uh, make it so that all of these unique, uh, this melting pot of, of, of creative gifts that can be brought to upgrade the system can actually be actualized. Um, and brought forth, and that's a really beautiful way to, to view it and put it, yeah. We are all part of the moral community. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other thing that you mentioned there was that you can take these on the individual story-by-story -story basis of getting behind the eyes, which is extremely important. And 
we can also do things like take it onto larger uh, numbers also to uh, hopefully uh, entice other people to care more about this. And uh, we were talking about this just a little bit ago, but these uh, refugee camps around the planet, um, we're not even talking about people coming and knocking on the door seeking uh, refuge or asylum and seeking greater economic flourishing um, for themselves and their children, but we're talking about camps filled with hundreds of thousands of people around That's the correct. world where it's just stuck in the camp. Yes. itself. And if you view any of these photos, um, there's like the Dadaab refugee camp. There's yes. many of these with hundreds of thousands of people where it is like little shanty towns. Yes. And um, it's it's not, uh, you know, we, we sit here with the utmost uh, privilege compared to that. That's and we correct. need to be very uh, aware and um, and respectful to that privilege and then use that privilege to support uh, redesigning the social fabric so that more people can be uplifted faster into greater flourishing that's the bur that's the burden on that we have yes on us that's why I wrote the book for my students it's the young people who will need to take on that responsibility to help out I love it. I love this one. I want to ask you um, another question. This is a, probably the last question, and we can revisit this as we um, hopefully continue featuring people that are studying um, specific, uh, such beautiful, specific anthropological um, macro movements like this, as well as on a micro level, getting behind the perspective of all of the individual's eyes um, so we can better understand our humanity and how to, how to build the next world. Um, the last question I really like asking our guests is, uh, what do you think is most beautiful? That uh, we are able to sit next to each other and talking and having a conversation. I, it's a privilege. I'm happy about this opportunity. The fact that we are talking about a very difficult human condition I'd like to have more opportunities to talk about that. I'm really happy that you answered that way. We can find the um, peace and harmony and uh, dialogue that happens between humans on how to build the next world. Uh, we can make it happen together and enjoy these heart-to-heart -heart interactions. I, I love it, Swan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank I really you very appreciate much. all your great work. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out the links in the bio below to Identities on Trial in the United States. You can find the link in the bio below. And you can find all of Swan's other links in the bio below. And also support the American Anthropological Association as well. You can find their links in the bio below. You can also find simulations links in the bio below. You can help support us so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to great places like AAA's annual meeting to interview their leadership. You can find us on PayPal, Patreon, Cryptocurrency. You can design cool merch and get paid. All those links are in the bio below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Hey everyone, before we end this episode with Swan, I would like to introduce Nancy Konvalinka. She is a professor of anthropology at the National Distance Education University in Madrid, Spain. And along with her colleague Raul Sanchez, they are editors of the Lexington book series with this theme, Crossing Borders in a Global World, Applying Anthropology to Migration, Displacement, and Social Change, who Swan is one of the authors in this book series and we would like to talk about this book series a little bit the purpose of it and what else is going to be released in 2020 thank you nancy thank you very much i'm very glad to be here we ha we are really excited about this book series because it's not just another book series on migrations mm -hmm. we want to get theoretical methodological approaches but we also want the books to have a practical nature as was very obvious in, in Swan's research, where she is using her research to give expert witness 
Mm -hmm. for cases that go before court and actually do things for real people. So that's yes. part of, it's, I, I'm, not all anthropology is, is applied, but this is one of the areas where applied anthropology can be very interesting. We're also looking in this series at migration in a very broad sense. So we can be talking about economic migration, about people who migrate for all sorts of other reasons that are not necessarily economic, sometimes looking for a better situation, sometimes simply pursuing a career that is easier to carry out in one place or another, or um, even reproductive migration, mm? Mm. people who travel from one part of the world to another seeking reproductive services or seeking to provide reproductive services that mm, are not allowed in their own countries or that are too expensive in their own countries. So we're looking at all of these different areas. So we think it's, it's a new series that brings together two kind of different areas in that way and also has a very strong applied aspect to it. Yeah, I love the focus on the applied anthropological side of it. Plus, I love how you broke down all of these other reasons for migration. Um, and also, just we were talking about this earlier with Swan on the episode, just getting behind the eyes of all these individual cases that mm -hmm. are so diverse. It's going to be a very interesting series. Um, one of the books that's also out with Swans right now mm -hmm. in the series is Crux of Refugee Settlement, Rebuilding Social Networks. Exactly. It's an edited volume. The editors are Andrew Nelson, from the University of North Texas, Alexander Rudlach from Creighton University, and uh, Ruth Williams of the University of Leuven. And it's a book that talks about how pe refugees are resettling in other areas and exactly what processes they go through and implement with, with their own agency to do this, how people depend on relatives who have already settled there, how they create community centers. And one of the very interesting things about this book is that it has a lot of participant anthropology, meaning, meaning in this case that after each author writes his or her chapter, hmm, uh, there is a commentary by someone who is a non-anthropologist who was also involved in the research. In some cases, it can be a social scientist who was there, mm -hmm. a social worker. In many cases, they're the very community leaders or different people who do participate in the community of the refugees who have resettled, talking about the author's analysis. So we're not just getting an anthropologist's cold analysis of, of something that's happening perhaps, but mm, people from the community commenting on what this anthropologist is saying, whether they agree, whether they disagree, whether there are other areas they think should be considered also. So it's an, an, another exciting book and again, a little bit different from, from what is usually just a plain ethnographic analysis. Yeah, I love the application of wanting to study how the formation of social networks happen of um, a refugee or a migrant. Mm -hmm. um, as we were just talking about this on a very recent episode with Augustine Fuentes and when we talked mm -hmm. about um, how uh, the greatest indicator of people's uh, ha happiness uh, at the end of, of their lives is how many uh, close friends that they had. That mm -hmm. yeah, I thought that was one of the really interesting studies. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how those actually form, those social networks form in such a migratory, um, especially having a, 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 a family myself that came, uh, my mother, uh, at the 25 year point in her life from uh, Armenia to the United States had me here. So I mm -hmm. see her doing that exact same process of, of making a social network at, the, some, at a point in 25, uh, at that point in her life as well as my uncle and grandmother. Exactly. Um, it's so interesting, yes, it's so, so interesting. It is. Awesome, so the, the series will have approximately six more books, they're under preparation right now. Right, we have six more authors that have sent us their uh, proposals and they've all been really interesting. They're, they're finishing up writing the chapters now and we hope to get these books out in 2020. And we are always interested in book proposals that are based on ethnographic work yeah. because we always insist uh, in anthropology that you can't just speculate about something. You have to have talked and worked with real people who are in that situation in order to be able to give a nuanced, detailed analysis 
of what's really going on and avoid all those big categories that don't really serve people on the ground who need things done. Yes. So, so there, we're always looking for projects that are ethnographic projects that deal with any aspect at all of migration, and we're looking forward to a long life as a, as a book series and to many, many more publications. Wow, okay, so ethnic, ethnographic uh, publications of migration may also reach out to you, with those of that course, want to please for do. this series. Mm -hmm. Okay, so reach out in that context. Also, um, the links in the bio will be below um, for both Swan's book as well as um, who who was the author of the Crux? Um, there, it's it's an edited book by three authors: Andrew Nelson, Alexander Rudlach, and Ruz Williams. Okay, great. And so mm -hmm. that book link will also be in the bio below. And then there is also is there a main page for the theme as well? There actually is. It's. Um, uh, there's a page on the Lexington uh, web page. I will send you the link so that it can be there too. Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. So all those links are in the bio below. And thank you very much for tuning in again to the episode with Swan. And do check out this thematic book series again that Nancy was teaching us about. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank really, it was nice. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah.